Hey everybody, it's John Graham here with my good friend Brad Faxon and uh, we're just going to have a quick little chat about some of Brad's putting history. Uh, earlier this morning James asked a few questions uh, on Instagram. We're going to kind of throw those at Brad and see how those turn out. So I'm going to kind of get this started with this question, Brad. So when, what would be the one thing or two things that you can think of that changed your putting for the better that you wished you had learned sooner now that you look back on it? I'm not going to act like this is the first time I've heard this question. I heard it about 20 minutes ago. I still don't know how to answer it. But I can tell you, as a kid, I, I'm sure I grew up, like every new golfer, hearing things like, you got to take the putter back low. You've got to take it back slow. You got to accelerate. You got to follow through. You got to keep your head down. Mm -hmm. I mean, those, that's what everybody right. was taught. Um, early on, when I got out on the PGA Tour, I met Ben Crenshaw, maybe my second or third year on the tour, and I always like to talk to the best players in the world about what they did, whether it was Greg Norman on driving or Crenshaw on putting, Payne Stewart on long irons. Just what do they think about it? And Crenshaw said a couple interesting things to me that really, um, I don't want to say they changed my life, but they, they helped me become a better putter. And he said two things I thought were very interesting and very different than what we had all been taught. He said, number one, I like to, and he told me at this particular time, that, and this was the year after he won the Masters, that he always liked to make his stroke backstroke longer than his follow through. He said he had been in this rut where he was hitting at the ball and not through the ball, and that's mm -hmm. kind of yeah. esoteric. But then yeah. he also said, and this was interesting, he said, I like to let my head and my knees move when I putt. Let me say that again. I like to let, <laughs> allow, my head and my knees to move when I putt. He says, after all, a putt is a mini swing. Mm -hmm. Now, Ben Crenshaw was yeah, one of the greatest putters that ever lived right. um, with a style that was different. You know, he had a, a blade putter that he ain't, you know, the 8802 that he put the ball out on the toe, mm -hmm. kind of took it inside, came over the top or across. Um, and he had a funny setup, a peculiar setup, left shoulder much higher than his right. His, weight was forward, his hands were forward, he had a forward press, um, and he said, and what I, what I liked about it, John, and maybe it's crazy, is, is it, it allowed me to stay what I feel softer in my body. You know, mm -hmm. when he said, I, I'm gonna allow some freedom, because I always felt like when I tried to lock in, keep my head dead still, I always felt like I would pull or tense up, mm -hmm. and I, I never liked to pull apart. Gotcha, I liked it. I remember hearing some very similar stories where, where Ben would say, after somebody came up and asked him, you know, what are you working on, Ben? It's like, well, I'm trying to get my head to move more forward. Or things like what you just said, that people would be, they would hear that and be like, I've never heard anybody ever try to teach that. And then here's one of the best putters of all time talking about doing something that they're just not used to hearing. No, and I think it looks odd when, when I see some players, and Nick Fowlow did it for a while, would keep his head down or his eyes fixed for an excessively long amount of time. And it didn't look natural to me. We've always been told head down. I, I've always kind of liked eyes on following the ball. Yeah. And, and you know, I don't want your head to look right. down at the target before you hit yeah. it. But I also don't like that, that unnatural look. Gotcha. So when you first get on a putting green, let's say it's a Thursday morning before you go out to play at a, a tour event, what are the things that you like to do first? Well, on the practice green, two things I think that are that are crucial for me. I've always wanted to hit some long putts across the green and just um, get a feel for the speed, mm -hmm. you know. And I would hit long putts in all the different directions. So I've up the hill, down the hill. Yeah. Um, and as Crenshaw said one time, he says, "I like to watch the ball roll." Right. You know, I want to get a feeling for that. Feel, get the feeling in my arms and my hands. And then, I think what I did consistently well for my my entire career is I would get you know, one ball around the hole and go through my pre-shot routine, pre-putt routine, yeah. um, and make sure I hit some putts from four or five feet. Um, you know, I always used a line to, uh, on the ball to, for my target line. Mm -hmm. And I'd hit four or five putts going through my full routine and be more concerned about what does my routine feel like than whether the ball actually went in the hole. Right. You know, and we right. always talk about process, process, process rather than result. And I think you got to train that. I don't think you can just say, oh, just think about the process right. and not the result without actually doing it. And I, I did 
a really good job my entire career of that was the first thing, the last thing I did before I went to the first tee. And probably if I practiced after the, the round, making sure I did a few of those before I left to go back home. Gotcha. Okay, great. Um, all right, one last question before we hit a couple. Is there any one or two things that have been issues in your stroke or your process set up, whether, whatever it may be, that you kind of keep coming back to and say, okay, well, this is one of the things that, you know, it's kind of like a bugaboo for me. I just want to always kind of keep an eye on it. What would those be? Yeah, a few things. I, I tend to get ball a little bit farther forward than I would want to have. And w when I get that way, I think my putter tends to go back a little bit too straight. And then I kind of loop a little Crenshaw-ish. Mm -hmm. And then I finish a little bit too far to the left. The, the path goes a little bit to the left afterwards. Now, do you end up getting a toe hit that goes off right, or you get a pull? I like to hit, well, I'd rather miss to the right than to the left. Right. I hate to miss. But, yeah, we've talked that. Yeah. Yep. And um, it would be more of a little bit on the toe okay. than, than on the heel. And, you know, I, I sometimes back up a little bit mm -hmm. with my head, which if Crenshaw says it's okay to move <laughs> your head a little yeah. bit, that's, yeah. that's okay. But, yeah, I, um, that, that's one thing I would fight, ball forward. Sometimes my stance gets a little bit narrow for, mm -hmm. you know, this perfect world. Um, yeah, and I, I said that's that's kind of what I've kept, uh, kept doing. I, I've done a pretty good job, I thought, of, of getting my arc of my stroke back inside a little bit, so I didn't have to do that as much. Okay. Um, that that took a lot of time. I worked a lot at Scotty Cameron's studio with Scotty and Paul Vizanko, and mm -hmm. um, that was not a change. I think a lot of times I see people expect their stroke to change immediately, right? right. Immediate change, right. where it it can be done over. a I, and I think you can still play and play well doing this and make more of a long-term goal than a short-term goal. Gotcha, gotcha. All right, so we've got a, a group of balls here. Do you prefer to see players practice with one ball or with a sleeve or with a group? Well, it would depend. It depend. would depend okay. on whether you're going out to play and, and play competition. Okay. Um, and whether you're you know, practicing and doing some more drills or exercises. Okay. Um, if I were going out to play and I'm glad I'm not going out to play today because it's freezing <laughs> and it's windy. But yeah. um, I would prefer to go through some, you know, full-time routine stuff. Uh, and I know there's a lot of talk now about this random versus block sort right. of practices, and I think there's times for both. Yeah. I don't know if you agree with that or not. No, I absolutely do. I think if a, a player is working through a particular idea and they just want to get more repetitions in in a less amount of time, maybe they've got some place to go. I can see having a group of balls, okay, let me just try to work on this particular feel. Yep. If they're getting ready to go play or whatever, I, I certainly prefer one ball and more like they're going to encounter when they go play. Yep. Yep. For sure. Now, I think sometimes in the interest of time, you know, if you're going out to play a tournament and you, you want to get a feel for the speeds, I have no problem hitting three balls, right. you know, taking your sleeve and whacking right. them around there yeah. uh, so you can have more chances to do that. Yeah. I, I think that's that's perfect yeah that's okay to that's do fair that. enough yeah okay yep. yeah let's see you hit a couple of these and, and kind of talk through the things that kind of run through your head um, as you're getting ready to hit one well I'm, I'm pretty visual when I putt I um I've always seen what I would call the action track mm -hmm. uh, I see a, a thin little line a, a tracer yeah. a ribbon um, Did you, yours, yours have a color Mine's, mine's black. Yours is black. Okay. Yeah, it's black. It's almost like if I scraped the tee along the ground. Okay, yeah. Or if I had a Sharpie, a, a black Sharpie, I would... Does, does your line go through the hole or does it end at it the hole? It goes into the entrance point. Okay. I've always putted better to the front of the hole rather than to the back of the hole. Okay. I don't care whether somebody... I, I like to have, you know, a, a nice target like that, but gotcha. I, I don't think it matters if it's front or back. Do you think more better putters over time tend to be more die putters or aggressive putters? I think younger guys are more aggressive and, and naturally uh, they maybe get a little timid. Um, there's a stat three putt avoidance that I think right. can get in somebody's brain negatively um, and cause that. But I do know for my career, that even later in my life when I'm still playing well, um, whenever I missed a putt, it was always past the hole enough where I had to mark it. It was never a, a okay. tap in. And I, I hear announcers on TV when a guy hits a 20 footer and it goes up to the edge of the hole, that's great speed. I'm like, I don't know if that's great speed. Okay. And it was funny, I was um, a few years ago helped Gary Woodland a little bit on the putting green and mm -hmm. we were talking about a bunch of different things and I told him that very same thing. I said, I like to see the ball go past enough where I 
had to market. And, you know, I felt like I worked hard a lot of times on my good putting rounds because I always had two and a half, three footers that were never gimmies. Mm -hmm. um, but I made them. Yeah. And, and Woodland played well the next week or two. And uh, I remember him saying, yeah, Brad Faxon said I need to hit it harder. <laughs> and I, and I was like, uh, no, I don't know. Exactly what but I, I can get that interpretation. But it's right. funny how, you know, people pick things up differently. So yeah. I think there's, you know, how you say something is important in, in learning what to say and what not to say. And then ultimately when to just shut up. Right. You know, when you see the light go on, right. when, you, when you're helping someone, that's a big key. Right. I've, I've heard people say that you can, you can judge the quality of a teacher by how little they say versus how much they say sometimes. Yes. That, that sometimes it's, it's more important what you don't say than what you actually do say. And, and learning how to figure out when, when is the right time to say something, when is the right time to kind of hold it in. Um, I really think that this game is so individual. I agree with you 100% that every player is different. I think it that would be really important depending on what time of year it is, how long is it before a player has competition, um, you know, how much do they like to work on mechanical stuff versus mental stuff. Um, that's interesting. And you know, one other thing too I, I thought was important when, when we talked about Crenshaw's um, thought about allowing the head and the knees to move and I, I always felt like that allowed me to have a little bit softer grip pressure but one of the things that goes along with grip pressure to me is arm pressure. Mm -hmm. You know, how, how tightly do you hold on? And I do this little check with players. If you want to hold on to this for a second, say, say you had too, too tight a grip pressure and I wanted to move the club, I can't. Right. Now, um, if I say lighten your grip pressure. Right. So this would, be my, this would be my normal. That's your normal. So yeah. I like to feel like when I hold the putter and move it back and forth, that your arms would bend a little mm -hmm. bit. So your arms are a little bit softer. Yeah. And inevitably, when I let go, the putter drops because right. you're feeling the weight of the putter for the first time. Right. Most of the time, people are death grip. You let go, right. it doesn't move. Right. And so I always have felt like arm pressure's got to be soft. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I always felt like a three out of 10 on the scale. Okay. But grip pressure can't be so soft. I don't want to twist this out of your right. hand. You know, right. so can you keep it a three yeah. and keep your arms a three? Because a lot of people, I feel like they get too tight in the in their hands and yeah. their arms and then they try and soften up just their hands but their arms get you know so right. can they all be soft and heavy because most of the players that have been good at putting for a long time to me have felt like they've been very aware that the weight of the head mm -hmm. yeah. um, they get a lot of feedback from their putters so they know when they've hit it solidly or you know off center yeah and yeah so kind of soft enough so that you can feel things moving firm enough so that you maintain structure Exactly. A good combo, would I you say? I think that's a great, I think yeah. structure's a great word for that. Um, I, I think sometimes, you know, our world is being taught by um, trying to, people that have had fear, doubt, tentativeness in what they do, yeah. so let's make bigger putters that have less feedback that swing themselves, basically, and I think you can do a lot of good with players and trying to bring some of that feel back. And, gotcha. So, so let me ask you another question. I keep interrupting you trying to hit some putts, but I, I'll probably miss them because it's so cold. <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel like a lot of people define control, like they're trying to control the ball, they're trying to control the stroke, or whatever, and they define it as they try to lock everything down and try to get things to not move so much. And they, so they define control as an inability for something to go wrong. Yes. I prefer to define control as can you actually feel what's happening. Which of those two would you think is closer to how you how you played it? Exactly what you said the second time. Um, okay. And it, when I see players that are trying to be too structured, too still, too rigid, rigid yeah, 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 those those things typically don't work well consistently yeah. for a long period of time. And um, you know, I, you see a lot of putters that that look so perfect over the ball. Now Tiger Woods looks so solid when he puts mm -hmm. um, Jason Day that have very square setups that look like everything's level and even. But you have a lot of great putters that were kind of outside that box, right. weren't they? That, you know, we just looked at some photos of setups of Jack Nicholas and Tom Watson and Jose Maria Olathabal right. and how different they all were. Right. Um, and some of the great putters in the world didn't even set the putter down, you know, correctly on the ground, and even players right. like Steve Stricker, who has right. the heel yeah, off the ground, way, or yeah, Seve Biosteros, Ioki. <laughs> but would you have changed that right. if you were an instructor and right. you said, uh, you know, you need to put that, make that flat? Right. Yeah. 
right, I'm not well, sure. Okay, now I'm going to actually the, let you the hit inevitable, some. right? <laughs> I got to hit a few putts. Let me just whack a few. This yeah. is a, a left to righter. Um, and the other thing too, John, is I, I think what I I've done well over my career was was um, trying to feel like I never tried to evaluate whether a putt was hard or difficult or more important than another one. Okay. Um, where you know we all know that you know certain putts can keep the momentum going mm -hmm. during your round, but I never wanted to. Is that okay? Yeah. <laughs> so, the, I would, that's the standard. That's what I would expect. Okay, so I, I missed every one of them before the <laughs> camera went on. Um, I, I played in a, a, the Fred Meyer Challenge once with Billy Andrade, a longtime friend and another great putter from Rhode Island, and we were on this first hole of. Um, this 36 hole best ball format and he had about a 10 footer 11 footer for a birdie on a very birdieable par five the guys were making threes and fours on this hole i had already made a five and billy had this 10 or 11 footer and i'll never forget this he missed the putt and he got mad he slapped his leg and he goes doggone it that was a I might have said something besides yeah. doggone it. that was a pretty easy putt that was such an easy putt and he, he said it a few times and i i just kind of laughed and i said to myself you know i never evaluate whether a putt's easier or harder. I, I don't think that does me any good. I just know every putt has a, a proper line and speed that, that right. you can make it with. And if you can, the closer you can have to that mindset, I think yeah. you're, gonna, you're gonna like putting a lot more yeah. if you can do that. Yeah, I like that. I, 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 I've often heard people talk about, well, you know, the whole never up, never in, you gotta make sure you get it there. And they always tend to assign that idea with hitting it harder than they normally would. Yes. And instead of, okay, well, I know I usually hit it a little bit past the hole. I'm just going to do that again. That's just my normal thing. Being aggressive or hitting it harder or make sure I get it there doesn't necessarily mean make the ball go farther than normal. It's just do what I normally do. Do what the you way I look at it. And, and by the way, I, I think these things that we say are always easy to say. Yeah. And, and <laughs> they, they can become difficult to do. But yeah. I, you, you've got to do it in practice first before you can do it in competition. You've got to know what that feels like. And I think you, you've got a really good sense with players on how to find different ways to bring that out in a player. And I would say that's, that's huge for, for longevity and consistency of, of good putting. Do you like your aim to be very specific or more ish? Kind of like this general area and I think I can make it from here or it's got to be here. No, I'm an ish guy. An ish guy, and, okay. And interesting enough, when I started working for Fox Sports doing the, the commentary for the U.S. Opens, we were talking about aim point a lot. Mark Sweeney, uh, the inventor, is that the right yeah, word? The yeah, founder, founder yeah. of, of yeah. Aimpoint called me up and said, hey, I'd like to come visit you. He lives in, close by in Orlando. We were right here on this yeah. green and um, the, the pin was over, the hole was cut over there. And I said, let's have a contest first. So I put the ball back here and this is a multi, you know. Oh yeah, multi-planer. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. was a tough putt and he, he went through his system and showed me what he would do for this putt that had ups, downs, lefts, rights, multiple breaks. And I asked him, I said, what have you learned? You know, because he said he's given over 40,000 lessons with his aim point and structures and everybody has gone through his teaching program. And he says, I've learned that you don't have to be as precise. Yeah. And I was like, boy, do I love that. So um, I'm an ish guy. Yeah. Um, you know, the ball's a lot smaller than the hole. Yeah. And, and I, I, would, I think I'd probably teach this and over teach this to most of the players that I play with, whether they're professionals or amateurs, is I love to see them experiment with hitting the ball in different speeds mm -hmm. so that you can you know you can see what maximum amount of break is yeah. you can hit one in firm and I think it helps a player's touch it helps their imagination it gives them an idea of what they can do on the golf course when they go to do that and when I first met Dave Pels and this would have been in the early 90s we were at the International that great course at Castle Pines mm -hmm. that Jack Nicklaus designed and had some of the purest greens I think we had ever played on and he gave me a cool exercise, uh, a practice drill, and it was for longer putts with a lot of break, is practice these putts and try them, leave them above the hole and short of the hole, you know, close to the hole, mm -hmm. but that way you would have to play the most amount of break and see what that was. And it was, he, he had done all his studies, his homework with different players, and, and almost inevitably most people underread the amount of break yeah. Then they under aim the amount of break and then they compensate during the stroke whether it's by twisting the face or adjusting the path mm -hmm. and i thought boy is this a great thing to do first of all it was fun 
uh, and we had a little game where if you did leave it low or if you did hit it past the hole, you'd have to pay the other guy um, a buck or something. <laughs> right, yeah. and, and I don't like games typically on the putting green that don't allow the ball to go in the hole. Okay. But I think things that are creative and things that are fun, yeah. that gets lost sometimes in instruction. And I get a little bit nervous watching top players before a round um, going out to a putting green for an hour, you know, before yeah. they go play. I would think you can get your work done in 20 minutes or less mm -hmm. um, so that you get your feels and, and, you know, your ideas of the speed and the brakes. Gotcha. All right, here's my final question. I'm going to put you on the spot. I know already that, have. I know. <laughs> We've talked a bunch about how when you were a junior, you did a lot of caddying, and you and you spent a lot of time really watching what the ball was doing more so than what the player was doing. Yes. Do you think that if you were going to take a junior, let's say, who's never done any putting or anything like that in their life, and you said you got a choice of here's a putter, let's go try and actually hit a few, or here's a ball in your hand and just roll the ball and watch what it does. Which of those two would you rather ha ha have them start? I, I, I think both of those could work. Mm -hmm. you, you know, I told you earlier when I was a kid as a caddy um, at Rhode Island Country Club where I grew up, which was a course Donald Ross designed with all kinds of break, and it was always due on the, the greens yeah. in the mornings when we went out to play. So you could always see the, the action track, the actual path the ball took. Uh, and it was always amazing to me where I had heard one of the members or another caddy said, well, this is a right edge putt. And you know, I'd watch the ball and it would break two feet. Right. And I'd go, no, they're just not right, are they? Yeah. And especially learning, and I used the word organically. You know, I didn't know what I was doing, but I just watched it. As the ball slowed down, it broke more, didn't right. it? The gravity took over if there were slopes. And being able to see that, I thought helped a lot. So if you, I, I kind of think now I, I'd Do you I'd, think other people are just missing that? They're not paying attention to it? Definitely not. Okay. They don't watch the ball finish yeah. enough. Yeah. And when they have a putter and they're trying to hit it to a hole, they're evaluating immediately what their stroke felt like, how they felt like when they hit it, mm -hmm. um, what's the ball doing relative to the hole. They're not really seeing what a ball does. So I think your idea of maybe rolling a ball along the ground and watching it go and... I remember Grant Waite, who was, you know, pretty, uh, I don't know, analytical mind, yeah, would you say? Yeah, you yeah. know, and he was a heck of a player. Yeah. Um, asked Crenshaw that, and Crenshaw said, look, I just, I like to watch the ball roll. I like to see what it does when it's along the ground, and um, I think we forget to do that. Yeah, yeah, I would agree. Well, Br Brad, thank you so much for your time. John, thank you for too. your Thanks time. Thanks for standing in the cold. Yes, it's cold. <laughs>